You look uh, you look perplexed over there. What's going on, man? All right, so my my players used a genie to get a wish because they wanted to go on vacation to a city, and I you know, I can't come up with it on the fly. I, I just don't know what to do, how to build this city. I just I'm you know I'm at a complete loss. It sounds like uh, no no no, Jim. This is easy. It sounds like you just need a bard and an earth elemental. I'm I'm not following you. What I'm not following you. Well, what, I mean that way you can build this city on rock and roll. We're yeah! Shit on WebDM. This episode is brought to you by Dungeon Fog, the online map maker and authoring tool for game masters. Save yourself hours of time generating awesome maps of buildings, rooms, dungeons, and more with GM Notes. And share, print, or export them with just a few clicks. They just got a big new update with a ton of new improvements, including duplicating and rotating rooms and levels and dynamic lighting that passes through windows and doors. It is really cool, folks. There's free, on-demand, and subscription access options, so go make a map today. Link in the comments and description. Uh, so, Jim. Yeah. Let's, let's build a city together. Let's do it. But, but like... Um, why, why, I mean, why should we consider this? Why shouldn't it just be like, there's a city with some walls? Like, like, let's, let's, let's take a walk down let's the lane into, that we're about to build. Yeah, yeah. So I think like, compared to dungeons or wilderness, cities in, in role-playing games are like, there's so much more going on, right? A dungeon sort of like self-contained. There's the rooms, there's the corridors that connect them. And while you can make the rooms interesting and engaging, and even the corridors, uh, you know, don't neglect them, but it's mm -hmm. separated and, and contained, um, even in a living dungeon. And sort of wilderness is the same way. There's these sites, these locations that you go to, and then the places in between, maybe you run into something, maybe you've got like rather complex, uh, you know, encounter and event tables or something that you roll on. But for the most part, the locations for adventure are, are far apart and relatively separate. Whereas with an urban campaign or a city, like <laughs> there could be three or four adventures in one location and right next door are three or four adventures. And like on even just one street, there could be enough going mm -hmm. on to fuel an entire year's worth of gaming, if not more. And so because yeah. of this, like <laughs> the saturation of information and hooks and, and possibilities, it's easy to go like overboard with it it's easy to get overwhelmed by the 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 amount that you would need to prepare for or that you feel pressure to prepare for and so i, I think it really really is one of those things more more than dungeons more than wilderness more than like a, a kind of travelogue style campaign it's like really consider what is this city for what am i going to use it for at the table and and what is it that i want it to accomplish because you can go like super abstract and the city is just like a list of descriptors and then the one place that you need for that moment of game. Or you can go like way concrete and have this like multi-tiered approach where, yep, you know everything that's going on in this city. It's a living, breathing entity. It, it exists outside of the session when you prep and are rolling dice to see what's happening and what's going on that week. And so like you really can set yourself up for success by building in game structures and procedures, which will then give you the confidence and base to improv because you're going to have to improv in the city. There's no way, <laughs> no sane way to have everything yeah. already mapped out. Uh, so you're giving yourself tools to create something that's like more than just a travel guide. It's like a living place. Uh, and, and you know, it's worth it. City campaigns are great. You can do an entire, you know, one through 20, uh, sort of campaign in one location and they can really get to know it. So it's very satisfying, but it's, it's not the easiest thing <laughs> to prep for as a DM. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. And, and like you said, you know, if you want to get really concrete with it, you're going to need some rebar in there for some support. Yes. And I think that support should be like the, one of the first things you think of, which is, um, what is the purpose of yeah. this city? Like why, yeah. like, what are you, what are you building this for? So let's start, mm -hmm. let's start walking through that. Uh, um, like what would be the purpose, uh, in, in like when you're building a city, uh, mm -hmm. where do you start? Yeah. So the purpose for me is like, I, I want to know what it is that, that I'm trying to accomplish in the game. 
And sometimes like the city is just a stop along the way. You don't really, mm -hmm. you're not going to sit there and do a lot of, you know, do a lot with it. Maybe it's a one shot uh, or something that you're not really going to spend too much time. The, the city is like a background or a backdrop for, for yeah. this particular adventure. And it's just a dash of color, a dash of flavor. You know, you don't need that many things for it in which case you don't mm -hmm. need a lot of prep uh you know you, you just don't need a lot and i think maybe the, yeah, yeah. the temptation there is like well it's a city all this stuff could happen and oh man i could do this and that and the other and it's like well you really just need the one thing out of it so don't go overboard um, yeah, yeah. The, so, yeah. The adventurers were sent out because you know this city uh, provides all the wheat, and now all the brewers in the big city are are having a shortage, and that's all you really need to know about that city out there, right? Right. I mean, right. It, it, yeah. it could be just like that. Yeah, it could just be like that. Yeah, and so you don't necessarily, like I said, you don't necessarily need a lot. Um, now, for a longer term uh, style mm -hmm. game where the, where the the city is the focus of the campaign, it's almost a character yeah. in and of itself you really want to set that up like you really want to create a variety of, of procedures and structures and and information for yourself that will help you both improv and and bring the place to life right because one of the things about a city that 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 i like when i'm a player is when it feels real is when it feels like i could just go off in any direction and 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 like get into trouble find something to do talk to somebody and, you know, you can't do that in a dungeon unless you bring a miner's pick or a bunch of, you know, shape earth and pass wall style spells. Uh, and you can do it in a wilderness. But just be honest, most of the wilderness is empty. There's not much there. So, you know. yeah, I mean, well, you you passed uh, a few more trees. There's some shrubs yeah, in this yeah. one area. Right. Three days yeah. later, you see some game animals and, you know, like that's it. But, you know, like I said, one street of a city, there could be a year's worth of gaming in. And so like preparing mm -hmm. yourself for that because it's it's worth it to bring that city to life. Uh, and so using, you know, if you're going to play long term, building those things for yourself is going to be important. Um, but okay. regardless, like the other thing to consider when you're thinking of the purpose of it is like, is this supposed to be like, how does it fit in your world rather? Like, how does it mm -hmm. embody something about your world that you want to display? Is there significance to the location? Even if it's for a one shot, like why this place? Why this city? Yeah, yeah. Uh, gotta have what a makes it concept. unique? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so like, I'm thinking like this, you know, in our NPC show, when we're talking about like evocative NPCs and, and what makes those memorable NPCs, there's something unique about them. There's the one thing yeah. that that you can use. And I think it's the same with the city, right? Like, what's the one unique thing? You know, if you're going long term, you want more than that. But you start with that one thing. This is a city built near a waterfall. Is this a flying city that's crashed and now they're rebuilding? Is this, you know, a city that's like, uh, you know, humans on the surface and subterranean, uh, you know, cultures in the, uh, you know, in the tunnels? Like, what is it that sets this city apart and that you can use as a shorthand to describe this to the players? Oh, yeah, this is the iceberg city because it's and on an iceberg <laughs> or it's on an iceberg, you know, yeah. it's on an iceberg or this is the canyon city or this is the city at a planar nexus or whatever it is something short and something sweet and ideally it ties into the fantasy elements of the game and then you know the other thing to consider and this is really more for long-term uh style cities is like are you going to build this thing from the top down or the bottom up are you looking for yeah, like oh, yeah. to understand the city as a whole from the get-go, all of its institutions and functions and districts and everything? Or are you just gonna like have an idea for all of that and really focus on one place and then grow it out from there? So like an example yeah. of this would be the Street of Spells. This is a campaign I've run several times, both on stream and off, where it, it t literally takes place on one street. <laughs> and this is the street in a city where they sell uh, spell components. You can buy scrolls, you can buy things to fill up your spell component bag, arcane foci, and then it's like the secondary sort of uh, arcane services that there might have, alchemists, scribes, uh, the bar that, you know, all the wizards go to when they're not, uh, you know, engaging in spell research or something. And so I, you know, that was my idea for it. I had really no idea, you know, what else was there um, in, in concrete terms. And then I prepped like three locations there. 
the tavern, the the house and location of a patron, and then uh, the location of a supporting NPC. And then from there, having an idea of like, okay, this is the general character of the street. These are three specific locations that I'm going to use in the very first adventure. And I have an idea of who else might be there if I need to come up with an NPC on the fly. But that's it. <laughs> you know, I'm not doing much else because I want to like make my prep as efficient as possible. And as the campaign grows, I'm going to add more to it, add more to it. And then it will develop organically as opposed to like, this is the way it is all over. And, and we're not going to deviate mm -hmm. uh, and change from, you know, from this macro perspective. So yeah, that's how I like well, to do it. <clears throat> see, yeah. See, I, and I do both like, but as a, as a counterpoint, the way I developed uh, a city in my Spelljammer game, Nero's Gates, which is, it's kind of like uh, the rock of Gibraltar a little bit, if there were two of them and then an arch connecting them, but yeah, there's yeah, a pass yeah. that this, this thing protects. And, but I was just like, what would a city look like if it was established by like a basically like a pirate captain and his armada and a bunch of dwarves like what would that look like and where it's just right. like there are steps built into the rock where there's levels of the city so that you know each level has its own unobstructed view of the ocean and yeah, and yeah. Uh, everybody like there's complete purpose in everything that is built and ways of getting around that is mostly like what, sailors because there's all these like pulley systems to get to different levels not elevators but literally you grab a rope and you literally get yanked levels, up to yeah. the next level because this is they were like well it works um <laughs> and so like thinking about it like how would this city be established and be built but we're hundreds of years later um like as that being the starting point, I found um, immensely satisfying to create a city like that, like extrapolating yep. from a, just an, an idea. Um, and, and, you know, probably the second thing I made after just making the general layout was just like, how is it run? It's a captain's council because, yep. Yep. you know, the, the, that's how it should be set up. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but then mm -hmm. after that, it's all just purpose. And um, that's what I love about this game is there are multiple ways to come to a final conclusion yes but you have to yeah. know why you're getting like why you're taking the path you're taking right. and right. so um and and to build on that like it's not even that you have to pick one way of doing it one style of doing it and stick to it right you you can do a mix you know and, and they're going to mm -hmm. reinforce each other right if knowing the bottom-up approach the locations you need to, to you know to prep for your game that's going to be informed by the top-down approach because if it's yeah. a highly regimented city then you know what that's going to inform the decisions you make uh, from the bottom up another game i've run and and this is a city i've used many times is middenheim from warhammer and I've probably run it, run that particular city in three or four separate games, maybe. Mm -hmm. And understanding like the conflicts, the districts, the wards, uh, sometimes it's set after the storm of chaos. Sometimes I'm not dealing with any of that, <laughs> you know, and <laughs> we don't need that. Right. And, you know, in a game like the enemy within having a macro perspective is going to be important because this is about like dealing with court intrigue and, and what's going on at the highest levels of power, whereas running like a low level street gangs dealing with skaven and the sewers game is like i need two or three buildings a couple of npcs you know yeah. that kind of thing we just need a bar uh, <laughs> just right you just need a bar right uh and, the and in that sense you know you guys as the players created that uh <laughs> during uh during our intro session so so yeah I, these are all things to consider before you actually like sit down brass tacks and start prepping this thing and creating stuff for yourself the kind of prep that you want to do the sort of creating this city itself um, mm -hmm. you know, th they build on each other, you know, things you're going to use for a short term, uh, kind of game are going to, you can build up into the more long term stuff. And so that's why I like a bottom up approach because it, it grows organically what, you know, you prep what you need and then it will go from there. Mm -hmm. Um, and so like really the first thing that I think of when I think of a short term approach is like, am I going to map mm -hmm. this thing or am I not, <laughs> you know? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah I, i'm right there with you jim mostly I, I when i start to map a city i'm like i just suck at drawing and that's what usually discourages me the most <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> I, I i'm no good as as well uh but i i don't care about that i i'm uh i know that i understand where you're coming from you know i understand like yeah. it's there's a certain style of of city drawing and city mapping that 
it, you know, if you're not, if, if that's not you, then you might think like, oh God, this is terrible. Guess what? No right. one else has to see it. No yeah, one no else. One. <laughs> so it could be a bunch of scribbles. <laughs> Yeah, personal baggage aside, what it, what should what should uh, our DM perspective and, and and current DMs think about when they're thinking about mapping a city and whether or not to? Yeah, so for like a short term game, honestly, a map isn't needed. Uh, it could be useful. You might uh, gain some benefit from it, but if you're literally just like we're going to do one session in this place, then all you really need is a map of the locality and a general idea of layout so that you can give a description of the place. You know, this mm -hmm. is a kind of thing where I'm, I'm probably just going to do like a word map uh, or something where it's just sort of, you know, take a piece of paper and, you know, a gatehouse, uh, you know, guards are lax, uh, big backup getting into the city. Okay, market square, bustling, it's a market day you know yada 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 pickpockets rampant uh and then the adventure location and then i'll have a detailed map npcs things like that but those other locations are just there to quickly get through them we're not worried too much about like what's going to happen if if the players stop there presumably this is something where they know where they're going and they're making a beeline towards it um now they might surprise you and catch you off guard, in which case, uh, you know, stay tuned for the rest of the episode to figure out how to deal with that. <laughs> but well, those initially just be so lax. <laughs> they really shouldn't be. Why are they lax? Um, yeah. And so, you know, you don't need one. It might be helpful to have one. But, uh, you know, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Um, mm -hmm. Just an abstraction and enough to give the city uh, an evocative description uh, is what you'll uh, is what you'll need there. Okay, so uh, whether or not they want one, hey, we'll see. But uh, yeah, what are the essentials you. though for a for a short term uh, game? What what do you mm -hmm. actually need? Right for that. City? Um, for what you need for that city, I'm focusing on the adventure location more than anything. Um, you know, mm -hmm. that's going to inform, uh, you know, how I describe the place, what sort of, uh, you know, buildings and streets and alleyways, landmarks that the players are going to run into. And for this case, I want like something really solid and really evocative. And, and even if they don't branch out into the rest of the city, this little place I know a lot about and you know it could be that I'm uh, you know I'm running something that's like a front for a cult or something that I know how they operate who their connections are within the neighborhood how they stay hidden who who is it that might uh, run interference for them what groups might not like them there uh, and that applies for a lot of things uh, you know a lot of faction based plays like how does the faction function in this locality how does the bad guy organization get around and and maneuver in this one place by focusing on that one location you don't have to worry about how they operate in the rest of the city what the rest of the city thinks of them or whatever you just really like you need to know the information just to run this adventure and so like brief descriptions and i take a lot of inspiration from like actual city travel guides Right, like oh, yeah. find a right, like find a real world city that you want to be inspired by, and maybe you just read those descriptions. Like you don't even change them. You just like, oh yeah, my you know this city is based on like Budapest, so I'm just gonna find a travel guide to Budapest to just like read that and and get a sense for the city the and, or at least yeah. Yeah, right at least be inspired by it change the names file the serial numbers off um but that's like going to save you a ton of time and usually those descriptions are really evocative and and they're really mm -hmm. you know they're they're trying to get like actual travelers to go there and spend actual money so they have a, a sense of just vibrancy and and they're usually focused on things you can do right like if you're mm -hmm. a tourist that's sort of what the tourist guides and the travel guides are there for. So that's the yeah. style I'm going for. And I will completely rip off real world travel guides just to yeah. save myself time. <laughs> I'm just imagining a fan out there watching this video who's a travel agent who's been working up the, 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 the courage to actually DM. And they hear you say that and go, this is my moment. I've arrived. This is my moment. <laughs> I can do this. Like, yeah, you can, yeah, you can man. Uh, so <laughs> once I've got the, the feel of the city, right? Like the local uh -huh. color, um, move on to key NPCs. And these are short, oh, yeah. sweet, 
don't need a lot there maybe you know the antagonist the major ally and then a third you know sort of wild card and then any other npcs i'm going to generate on the fly or or just keep generic right generic city guard captain generic tavern owner generic street urchin you know yeah. uh, things like that and i would consider those like three essential npc archetypes for a city street urchin guard captain tavern owner shopkeep you know something like that oh, um, yeah yeah it gives yeah, you a good yeah. <laughs> right the Depending authority is someone you could they talk go to. into yeah. right yeah yeah exactly what kind of shop are they going into and then you modify it a bit you have an idea in your head of what they're going to be like but you also keep it loose enough that you can change things based on the actual situation um, oh yeah the other the other thing i'm looking for are like landmarks and locations a landmark is really important for a city it gives the players something to latch on to, a sense of uh, reference towards where they're going. Uh, you know, and in a short-term game, it creates a very evocative location. Is this centered mm -hmm. around a statue that's like a hero of the city or something? Is it centered around a, uh, you know, sort of like some kind of market or something like that where they deal with like one thing this is the butcher's market you know you, you got some of that uh you, know, you got some of that sweet basilisk meat going on this is where you would sell it this is where they butcher it you know um oh yeah with some cockatrice <laughs> uh, hot wings uh, right you yes. can't look at them <laughs> you can't look at them some, right no you don't want to mess with them well, uh yeah, don't don't worry about say, that like, beak <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, just a cockatrice beak soup, um, right? But but yeah. but what I love about that is is even in a short like in a short term game like we're talking about, uh, it it is a a window to something deeper to a lore yeah. to to give it a, some established some some credence, and mm -hmm. and if they want to seek out more info about it, you it's a way for a DM to give an opportunity. Well, what's the statue yeah. all about? And, and and now you get to you finally as a DM get to, oh let me break open my book and, oh yeah let me see yeah and give right. you some no. give you a little bit of a lore dump um, there's a placard or some like crazy old person sitting around who's going to talk your ear off about it or maybe mm -hmm. there's like a programmed illusion a guy. that shows up right <laughs> yeah. you know, a travel yeah a literal travel guide um, this is why I like using monsters in my cities because they can kind of sit on the outskirts they don't have to be like super Super integrated into it but they could be there to like impart some of that lore or that local color like why are there a lot of methods in this place well you know maybe ask somebody talk to one of them uh, so that's gonna be like landmarks yeah. locations make it memorable um, yeah, they aren't dust methods. They used to be normal methods until they started became chimney sweeps, and now they're dust right. methods. Right, now they're dust that's methods. That's how you dust methods like are created. Yeah. Exactly, right? That's how they're created. Yeah. Dust methods are created when, an, or when a chimney sweep urchin gets caught. <laughs> <laughs> they yeah. just breathe in too much dust and now they're dust method. Uh, smoke method barbecue uh, is another one <laughs> that I've used. Oh my god. Smoke uh, method. Right. <laughs> smoke Come method from barbecue. dwarven barbecues. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and that's all you need. Like, that's it. Three words, a little concept, something, you know, the players will run with it. You can riff off of their uh, speculations and what they like and, and really, you know, that, this is the opportunity to, like, flex and exercise those improv skills without being, mm -hmm. like, super committed to something something uh and yeah. then everything else everything else about it is points back to the adventure events random encounters whatever they're pointed back to the adventure rumors hooks yeah. whatever pointed back to the adventure um the, the goal here is to like keep play focused on the goal which is presumably short term we're just going to get in and get out um, but you're also setting yourself up for having a solid base of operations if they do want to stay and branch out to a more longer term game Oh, most definitely. So, in a longer term game, and we're going to start with the maps again. Um, mm. it, in a long term game, and a map is, I'm not going to say it's essential, but it right. certainly does help keep players rooted and on target. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, it, and it gives you a sense of like where they are in the city and what they're mm -hmm. doing. Because, like, a long term city campaign like there's because there's so much going on it's easy to get like lost in the details of it so having like yeah. a, a, multiple maps 
right? Like this is how I like to do it. I've got like a big overall layout. What does this thing look like from the top down? This would be like a traditional city map with like the districts demarcated from each other and, and labeled. And I, I don't go so far as to get in individual buildings <laughs> on this. I'll, I might uh, outline different blocks of, uh, you know, of a neighborhood or a district or something. But th the goal here is to just have something of a general layout that is less like literal and more abstract uh, or at least relational, right? So like the big landmarks might go on the city map. And this might be something mm -hmm. I literally show the players so that they can go like, oh, well, what? this is the major temple. Okay, that's that. This is the barracks for the city guard. This is the Archmage's Tower. And we're sort of triangulated in the middle of that so that they know. You can just say like, oh, yeah, well, it's towards the tower or it's towards the barracks or it's towards the temple. And that gives a better sense of like where they are in the city than going like, well, you walk down this street east and then turn north and whatever. Well, you can just, <laughs> you know... <laughs> Well, that is the great debate amongst people in giving directions. Do you give them the go east for two blocks, then right, you know, or it's like no, go to go down to the temple and you hang a left. If you get to the to the to the dogmatic temple of uh, of Agra or whatever, you went too right. far. Um, you went too far. You got to double but, back. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, keep it keep it loose. You know, keep it loose. Trying to get to the sonic here. Right. And, and an idea of like what it's like to travel in that direction, maybe traveling towards the temple, the the layout of the streets gets more organized and the, the mm -hmm. buildings there become grander and grander and the streets cleaner and cleaner. But like as you go towards the Archmage's Tower, like the streets become like a warren of alleyways and, and, and footpaths and things like that. The buildings are older, kind of like hang over on top of each other. Parts of it, like you can't even see the sun as like the buildings have basically touched each other <laughs> and you're walking yeah, through yeah. a makeshift tunnel underneath them. It's a complete mm -hmm. tangent. Look up the Snickleways of York, right? This The city that's in Northern England, the Snickleways, uh, or the sh sometimes called the Shambles, or the part of it is called the Shambles, which is, I didn't know, was the name of an open air uh, butcher's market. Um, and it's it's these footpaths and alleyways and and like... Oh, yeah. A tangle of streets that have like shops and little things along them, but they're they're really sort of bring to life like what a medieval city looked like because medieval cities were they had no I, concept of layout or or districts or you know cars you know, that kind of thing. It's just <laughs> throw it all in there <laughs> and and well, it'll sort itself out, uh, which is why most of them were raised in modern times to create nice boulevards and straight lines and things like that. Um, oh yeah, yeah. So <laughs> but you, you can't be con you can't be claustrophobic living there. Like, for no, sure. you can't. It's going to be crowded. It's going to be smelly. It's going to be nasty and. So like having a, 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 an idea of that as they walk around this place on an abstract level is going to be helpful. We want to take it to the next tier. Now we're talking about a district point crawl. Um, this, is, this is the literal sort of like gamified layout of the city and might be the one you spend the most time using. Um, so you can take like the district by district approach where you, you know, building off our example of like, this is the temple district, this is the archmage's district, this is the barracks district. And like maybe between them are two or three other districts, depending on how big you want your city to be. You might have dozens, you might have you know, less than 10 or so. Uh, maybe if it's a rather small city, there's just like three districts. And understanding like how they connect to one another, how long it takes to move between them, what kind of events or encounters might the, the party stumble upon as they're going between those locations. And mm -hmm. in the same way that like a dungeon map has discrete rooms and corridors that you move along, that's essentially what you're doing for your city. It's understood that they could go left when you thought they were gonna go right and venture into the trackless wilderness of the alleyways and the like. But these are the well-known paths between locations, landmarks, right? And thinking of your districts as centered around landmarks is gonna be really helpful because then you can keep referring to things by di either directions or relations uh, between landmarks. But this gives you a solid, like, gamified way of, of figuring out how they move about the city. It's going to take you an hour to get across there. Well, now the players know. Well, I'm not going to cast a 10-minute spell, <laughs> you know, to, uh, yeah. you know to, to get between the two locations. I'm going to wait a bit. Or, yeah, you think it's going to take 
10 minutes to get there, but it looks like there's a guild procession that's going by and that's going to like, who knows when they'll be done. There's a lot of pageantry. It's a lot of yeah. <laughs> pride in the guild. <laughs> Or they're having, uh, yeah, it's time for the, the, the pilgrimage to the temple district, so do not get on the main boulevards today, you know. No, it's, yeah. It's ha they're right. having god parades. And yeah, so, yeah, it's the celebration. It's the new coronation of the monarch. It's, it's you yeah. know, it's Remembrance Day or something, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. And in that way, you can, you can portray the impact of these events in the city in a way that's more than just, oh, yeah, it takes you a long time to get there. Like, you can actually... Uh, make it part of the crawl through the city right the dungeon like a, a city crawl an urban crawl uh, is where you start mm -hmm. getting into uh and then within a district i will make a street by street not quite individual buildings but maybe um layout of the city so for like the street of spells i had like the main thoroughfare and then every other main thoroughfare that branched off from that. So like talking like six or so streets that have names, right? This is the street of familiars. This is Owl's Way, whatever. Mephit Corner. <laughs> and mm -hmm. then in between those and, and the, you know, the, the what's in like the nitty gritty, the alleyways, the, the, the sort of off the beaten path kind of places, um, those still remain abstract until the players get to them and I make them concrete. Uh, and that way... I'm not like really burdening myself with a ton of stuff, but I'm giving myself the option to build out as I go. I know where everything is in this. I know how to, uh, you know, present this and how it's going to look, what it's going to look like. And at some level it becomes a dungeon crawl. Like if you want to run it that way, right? You're walking down the street, you've come to an intersection between these others. You know that your place is over here that you want to go to, but it looks like the, the bad guys that you were chasing went a different way. Do you want to go here? Do you want to go there? You're going to find a different way. Can you cut them off? That sort of thing. And I'll be honest, <laughs> I cheat, not cheat. I use a die drop for this. <laughs> I'll take a handful of dice, blank page, assign various uh, variables to the dice. Maybe D6s are this, D4s are this. And then the number that comes up is going to be like the state of the building, you know. How and many then you just it has how many stories it has yeah there's all sorts of things what what the you know is it dilapidated is it being renovated is it is it nice is it busy there um you know codifying those details and then just dropping the dice on a piece of paper noting where their locations are uh and like figuring out how you want to um you know arrange all of that let's drill down to the essentials here um in terms of districts there are an amazing number of resources online which can give you beyond exhaustive lists of what sort of districts there are um, mm -hmm. we've mentioned it many times but the reddit r slash d100 has a ton of resources for this including like I don't know, <laughs> lists of every sort of building you might find in a district or a city, lists of every kind of district you might find, or the questions you might want to ask yourself about those districts. Mm -hmm. um, all of that is fodder for you to use. Don't, don't feel like you have to come up with these exhaustive lists yourself or that you need everything that's in there, but having an idea. Is this a military district? Is this a place where like the patrols are more common because this is where the militia hangs out or this is where like the Queen's army is barracks. And so law and order there is pretty, <laughs> pretty uh, tight and, you know, tight. It's not like a mm -hmm. lot of, uh, you know, stuff's going on unless you're a soldier, in which case it's a wealth of adventure opportunities and contacts and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. Getting a feel for what that district's like in terms of its, its like color its description you know is this sort of like the cultural enclave within a city is this where all the elves live uh within the city and it's like distinct from the others um street of spells one end is the theater district where there's a lot of just theater that goes on like uh <laughs> necromantic uh, shadow plays or or sort of like dwarven ancestral epics and then the other end of the street of spells is goblin town which is like a big pile of jumbled tumbled buildings and the warrens underneath them and it kind of like mm -hmm. rises like a ramshackle rickety mountain over the uh you know the surrounding neighborhoods um and like 
being able to distinguish between those as they move between uh, districts. What's the feel like? What's the color like? That's going to be informed by the type of district it is. And it's also going to be informed by like the features that it has. Um, multiple landmarks within a single district uh, is going to be handy in the same way that like landmarks for a district itself uh, are, are a good way to navigate around the city. Landmarks within a district uh, are going to be a good way to navigate within that district. Um, and, mm -hmm. and so it's a, it's like a multi-tiered onion, right? <laughs> or multi-layered oh, onion, definitely. right? Each level has the same things, but more. And, and it goes from abstract to concrete, the more you drill down, peel away oh, the layers, not to mix my metaphors. <laughs> Uh, wow, I think Sorry. it's okay to mix metaphors. It's a city. There's a whole lot going on. Because because on, one thing yeah. that I I usually try to think about, uh, and, and I'm not sure what this says about me, but like when it when it comes to like waste management, if we're talking about a city, how mm -hmm. do they get rid of their waste? And I mean like right. physical waste, like we're doing things, and now there's trash, and also personal physical waste like right because that's that that that's going to inform like uh when i one, one thing i think of all the time is uh in the song of ice and fire books you know like king's landing and and uh like the the, the streets right outside the 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 keep and those mm -hmm. are like the worst places to live you know that's like the flea yeah. bottom that's like you know there's right. there's refuse rolling down the streets itself um yes. like do you have that? Or if this is fantasy, I mean, obviously you got dwarves, you're going to build sewers. Now what's down there? Like, yeah. cause that just opens up like so many more avenues for adventure, uh, mm -hmm. literally, cause who right. doesn't love a good sewer adventure? Um, who doesn't love a good sewer adventure? An anachronistic and... sewer adventure. But this is where I find like answering those questions. Where do they go? With, where does the waste go? How do they produce food? How do they uh, transport goods around the city? What's the labor like? Who who like actually does things here? Yeah, that's where you can like start introducing the fantastic. My cities, um, there's a lot of conflict between the dwarven, uh, you know, dwarven ancestral labor uh, clans and the like goblin union uh, guilds. And so you get down into the sewers and like the goblins are, uh, you know, authorized by the city to be down here. But, you know, it's what are they going to do? Going to kick the dwarves out? So there's like a running conflict. Sometimes it's, it's, it's civil and it's like, no, I got the permits. No, I don't think so, dwarf. I, you know, these, this yeah. is my contract that I have. Well, my contract goes back two centuries or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and you just clogged but, up the pipes. <laughs> it's yeah. just clogged up the pipes. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but I've had other things where it's like, this is a giant pit in a back alley that they throw their garbage down. Because at the bottom of that pit is a gigantic gelatinous cube, like obscenely big, um, that they just feed things to all day. Or an audio mm -hmm. is another good one. Uh, you know, this is a cesspit or a midden that a bunch of audio live in. And we keep them fed with the refuse of the city because we don't want them to get out. Um, yeah. <laughs> in the Street of Spells, this is all taken care of by gutter fairies and dung gnomes. You know, you mm -hmm. you you keep your street clean, you keep your alleyway clean by leaving out like a little pint of beer and some sausages. And at night, the dung gnomes come out and they sweep it all away and they take care of it. And if you didn't pay, then they'll just leave it all on your doorstep and throw the shit all over your windows. And the gutter fairies aren't going to clean it out either. And everybody just knows that, like, you, you're nice to the urban fairies because they keep this place running. They're like the invisible yeah. workforce uh, that works for treats and and kind words, um, uh, you know, or, or the like. Or maybe you have automatons like golems or warforged or whatever clockwork uh, type creatures that do this. But like thinking about this will give your district color and and description and like a vitality and and by like mixing in the fantasy stuff here you're making it more than just like a faux medieval but really it's kind of modern uh style city that you see a lot of yeah most definitely what's yeah who, who's working the favor app now or uber Eats? right yeah who's <laughs> doing you know uh is, is it you know all these wizard familiars are flying through the air running errands or something like that um or this is where the sphinx holds court uh in their you know to judge uh people or to air mm -hmm. grievances people just come up and complain to it um so uh the next sort of essential thing uh for a district is key npcs 
Uh, and this yeah. is where checking out our show on NPCs can be really helpful because we'll like give you a lot of tips on bringing those to life. But who are the movers and shakers in a district? Who are who's if you need some money, who do you go to? If you're in trouble, who do you go to? If you need something special, some kind of piece of equipment or or something gear that's kind of specialized, who do you go to? If you need magical healing, is there someone around who can offer that? Did, some, did one of your party members die and you don't have a, a, the ability to raise them from the dead? Is there someone in the district who can perform that for you? And so, like, thinking in terms of services and things that players need, uh, you know, in, in the course of the game, the kinds of things that they need, as opposed to the more travel guide style, here's the leader of the place, here's the, you know, shop owners and the like. You have an idea for those, but the focus here is on what it is that players are more likely to run into. Who are they there to mm -hmm. see? Who will, who will they seek out? Uh, and really spend some time detailing those. I don't know who those are. I don't know your players. I don't know your game, but I bet you know. I bet you have an idea yeah. of what your players like and who they'll go talk to. Most definitely. And and like we've already mentioned before, you know, this is why you want to have, you know, rumors and and hearsay on the street uh, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that can point to these NPCs. It doesn't have to point yes. to a specific building or area. It can be maybe this NPC, like you said, the Sphinx is holding court this weekend. So, you know, it's going to draw a lot of people uh, to the town right. center. Um, yeah. And so, yeah. Um, and, but, you know, maybe uh, some people aren't happy about that. And that's where you have uh, different kinds of factions. Maybe uh, yes. the Thieves Guild yeah. doesn't want to get judged this weekend. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> right. One of their members is going to air a grievance and you got to stop them or they want them stopped yeah, or you want to protect them. He's going to turn snitch. He's going to turn snitch. Right. <laughs> Stool pigeon. Uh, <laughs> factions are, the, to me, the beating heart of a lot of D&D. &D. And they work less well for, for wilderness adventures. They work great for mega dungeons. But like urban campaigns is where they really shine. Who are the what are the social institutions of this place? <clears throat> mm -hmm. what guild structure does it have are they all artisanal is the, you know and and in that sense there is no end to the amount of artisanal guilds you can have uh it, like part of the uh you know the, the way that medieval production and labor goes is that it's broken up into very discrete things i just make this one thing and then and yeah. then i make it and somebody else comes and gets it and it goes to this other place we're not it's not like a you know a factory system or or a place where it's all integrated they're competing with each other they they have secret knowledge of, of how to do things right this is why the masons become the freemasons is because building shit out of stone requires very specialized knowledge and and they leverage that they keep it a secret so you know this might be that each type of magic school has their own guild it's not just that there's a mages guild but it's like there's a diviner's guild a transmuter's guild an evoker's guild you know uh not just a thieves guild but a pickpocket's guild a beggar's guild a sec you know a burglar's guild think of it in those terms like the more specific yeah. you can get the more niche you can get the more you have to play with um not everything needs to be that way but you can really benefit from having sort of like competing interests that are in the same broad category so like thieves guild but breaking that up gives you multiple types of competition between subgroups and factions and whatever like you know they might all pay homage or, or respect to the big boss but individually they are at each other's throats um yeah and so <laughs> factions and are don't go to the grifters union yeah. don't go to the grifters union yeah the, everybody knows that the <laughs> beggar king really BS. controls things around here <laughs> right <laughs> Uh, and so, yeah, the, you need you need to know information. Then the people you talk to are are the street people, the urchins, that kind of thing. Um, and the point of factions is to provide structure and organization for the interactions with NPCs, as well as a source of conflict. And because a city is defined by as much about its landscape and its layout as the social relations of a place that like thinking in terms of those factions helps you establish the social relations. One example I like to think of when thinking about factions and how they compete is that scene in um, uh, Gangs of New York where the yes. firefighters oh, are coming God. to save the house, except yep. the other ones show up and they're like, hey, this is our district. And, yeah. and, and, and like they have an argument while a house is burning and house being burning. looted, mind you. Yep. And that Why was all set yep. up. 
and being looted because the whole point of the conflict was so they could get in and steal stuff. And so, yeah. you know, you alert your pickpockets to go into this building because we're setting it on fire and we're going to delay the dwarves who are supposed to man this this area, you know, yep. with our goblin firefighters so you can have more time to do that. Like, like thinking about that and like that's that right there, that that could be a whole adventure. You know, um, yeah, yeah. I, I love the Gangs of New York is a great inspiration for for city campaigns because it gives you an idea of what a pre rational modern city looked like and felt like. Like, yeah, it's yeah. set in the eighteen sixties, I think, eighteen late eighteen fifties, eighteen sixties, but like there's a lot about it that's very medieval right it's about patronage mm -hmm. who you know what the person you know what they can get for you right and and the the blurring of the line between legitimate and criminal and and you know coercive and and you know you know uh, persuasive that's all blurred and intermixed that firefighter scene there's factions that tie in to the firefighters there's there's they have their own patrons their own allied factions you know it's not just them in isolation they both represent a tangled web of social relations that compass the entirety of the of different levels of the city in conflict with one another and only this brief portion is in direct conflict the others just have a, a you know a controlling interest a vested interest in this these events and encounters that that get fueled right mm -hmm. Uh, what what are some ways to fuel them? Like like how do you how do you um, I'm getting at here is how do you hook them? How do you hook them into this? Encounters? How do you hook them in? Yeah yeah yeah. There all of this is related events, rumors, hooks, encounters. They're all sort of play off of each other. Uh, mm -hmm. I would start with a time scale, especially for dealing with like background events that are going to inform the state of the city, but might not necessarily impact like play. Uh, is there one you know? Do, are you rolling weekly, monthly, yearly? Yeah. If you're going all out, you do all three, right? <laughs> and you'll have these intermixed. Like this year, the city's besieged. But in this particular month, it's a celebration of this thing. And then this week, this other thing happened. And so you have sort of a, a, a multi-layered approach. And then each of those can have their own set of hooks and rumors that will generate or offer possibilities for adventure. And then sort of mm -hmm. existing alongside that are location-based events. You know, so maybe this particular street or this particular neighborhood has its own table of events and encounters. Like the only way you're going to run into this type of person or this particular group of people or whatever is in this neighborhood. And you've you've embodied that in the encounter tables and in the, uh, you know, sort of inhabitants that you've uh, prepared for that place. You know, it gives a character to the city if walking towards the temple district you roll on one type of encounter table versus walking towards the Archmage's district, it's another type of encounter table. And we're talking small here. We're not talking big, exhaustive ones. We're talking like D6, you know, something that's, that is not uh, going to put too much of a burden on you, but it's going to be enough to portray the character of the city and make it like specific. Um, and then you just have rumors and hooks that are tied back to your locations, your NPCs, your factions, like, to me, they're the last thing I prepare when I'm preparing a city or really anything is the rumors and the hooks because I don't want to put something in that I thought was interesting, but then I never followed up with it. And then it comes up in play and I'm like, oh, shit, I wasn't ready for that. This doesn't really make I sense. Yeah. <laughs> this doesn't really make sense given how you know things have gone since there. So having them, having them flow out of the things you've prepared as opposed to like starting with them or, or coming up with them in isolation, um, you know, mm -hmm. tying them into what you've actually got is going to signal to the players that if you don't know what to do, go look for rumors. And those are the adventures that we have. Bodies are disappearing, you know, or maybe the bodies that are disappearing are the zombie labor for the constructors guild or whatever, you know the you know that their their contracts run out and and now some you know their rivals are really just trying to to hit them where it hurts kick them while they're down there might be three mm -hmm. or four rumors associated with that uh including ones that the party could just stumble on ones to seek them out um that kind of thing um another type of encounter i like to put in is just this doesn't involve the players at all it's just a thing that's happening 
a fight. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's one of those. I've never <laughs> the complete tangent. I've never been to Boston where I haven't seen a street fight, uh, <laughs> and some of them have been like right in front of me, right? Like literally, we have to jump out of the way of, of these uh, of these fights, or well, I'm gonna get involved with them. But that I remember them. I remember them very well. They they color my experience of the city. And it's yeah. one of those things now when I go to Boston, I'm just like, all right, where's the street fight? Like, I'm, I'm who's who am I going to see brawl uh, right now? Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, uh, last Geek Bowl, we went there, we came out of a bar, looked down the street and there's two guys just, just, two fighting, guys just like, fighting. Yep. There you go. All right. Now I know I'm in Boston. Uh, <laughs> but if your players walk out of a bar and they see the two heads of two guilds that they know about fighting in the street, like I said, that's an opportunity. Do you want to throw in on one side of that? You know, are yeah. you trying to garner favor with one of those guilds? Do you yep. want to piss off another one of the guilds? Maybe that's the only reason you get in is because you're like, yeah, screw that guy. You know, yeah. uh, look, looking to expand your influence. Yeah, yeah, I'll weigh in on one side. Yeah, and so like all of these things are designed to create an adventure. You really shouldn't be making anything that will not ultimately lead to an adventure. Um, and, and be prepared for anything that you do uh, introduce into the game that your players might think it's an adventure idea or an opportunity and then run with it. Uh, and so by keeping that in mind, uh, you're going to create yeah. stuff for your game that's going to be really useful. You know? So, Jim, what are some of the what are some of the tools that you use to, to grease the gears of your city to keep it moving, to make sure that you mm -hmm. stay on time with uh, with everything and, and make make sure it makes sense and that there's yeah, yeah. you know stakes um, involved. Right, there are stakes. I use or hot I make dogs, liberal whatever. use of uh, <laughs> liberal use of countdown clocks. <laughs> You know, yeah. um, w when does something happen? What are the conditions under which this this inches closer towards it happening? Uh, we've mentioned them before. A countdown clock is essentially like a pie chart or, or a literal clock that has maybe four to eight, usually four, six or eight sections. And then the DM just sort of like notes, what is it that fills up a section? And you're counting down to an event. So if it's, you know, one faction versus another, maybe we're counting down to when they brawl in the streets. Right. Or when one of them takes over or something or when one of them strikes back against the party, you know, so I'll make use of countdown clocks that goes in conjunction with what I call a faction turn. These usually take place in prep, not necessarily at the table, but it's some kind of rubric for, um, you know, what the factions are up to in between sessions. My favorite is to assign a die size to a particular faction. The higher the die size, the more power and influence they have roll them all at once and each numbers that come up or each die that come up with the same number that represents some kind of point of contact between those two factions street gang might be a d4 temple might be a d20 but if i roll a four on both of those then there's something about the temple and the street gang that is connected for this moment mm -hmm. and i'll use that to fuel rumors hooks encounters things like that uh, in this sense, your dice function as oracles. They tell you what's going on about your world and take some of the pressure off you to think up everything. And, and it, it becomes this sort of like, well, what is going on here? I don't know. And it kind of creates a game out of prep because you can sit there and sort of like, I, what's my city up to today? And then you, cons you literally consult the bones, your, your dice, your oracles to, uh, to figure it out. Um, mm -hmm. And then... Well, there's other tools like random tables. Our show on random tables goes into way more detail of it, but um, it, it's a good starting point. The, the best way to like make use of a nested table is in these urban campaigns because there's a lot going on. You might not know who yeah. it is that you run into, why they want to run into you, that kind of thing. I, I've said all I needed to say in, in the random tables episode. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, so as, we, as we take all this into consideration, Jim, yeah. What are what are some what are some final thoughts uh, to keep in mind that our that our DM should keep in mind when it when it comes to building your city uh, for your campaign? Yeah, yeah. Questions to to uh, to ask yourself, as a DM. Mm -hmm. I'm really fond of this idea of the urban body, that that systems mm -hmm. and organs within a person's body make good metaphors for a city, and for the life of oh, me, yeah, I definitely. cannot remember. <laughs> I cannot remember where I ran into this. This is not my idea. This is someone else's, but I do not have, uh, you know, I don't remember where I saw it. Um, but it's things like brains. Who's in charge of this place? 
Are there multiple people? Mm -hmm. if, if something needs to happen, who makes that decision? The heart. What keeps the city vibrant, alive? What purpose does it have? It, you know, is it healthy? Is it in decline? Their stomach. What do they eat? <laughs> you know, is this uh, you know is this produced in the city, outside of the city? Um, you know, what's the street food like? What are the kinds of things that you can give to the players to like let them interact with? Smoke meth at barbecue uh, would be where that came from for me. So just like that sounds like a fun thing to just like throw in and something that a player might latch on to. Um, the others are like muscles. Who does the labor? How do things actually get done? Your immune system. Who protects things? Who keeps things from changing? Is there a police force? Is it a guard? Is it up to each individual neighborhood to police themselves? Nervous system. How do they communicate with each other? How does news travel around the city? Is there some sort of centralized uh, uh, you know, way that this happens or is it more decentralized? What are the bones of a city? What's the history of it? Why, was, why this place? What is it that makes this physical location so important? That they just, that a city grew up here, and then like blood, how do things circulate? How does how do goods move about the city? How does uh, what's the infrastructure like? Digestive system. Where does all the waste go? <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. oh, you know, are there sewers? Is it something else entirely? Do they shunt it all into a magic portal and then forget about it? And then centuries later, mm -hmm. a bunch of people who got tired of being crapped on by interplanar garbage come back and invade the city. You know. Um, what's the reproductive that. system like, right? <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> this is one of those things that like not a lot of people are comfortable with, but maybe your players are, but like, what is the role of sex in this city? Is there prostitution? Is it regulated? Yeah. Final one is like gut flora, right? What's a part of the city and, and contributes to it, but is not like of the city. Are there outsiders here? Outcasts, criminals, that kind of thing. And I find that's really that's really conceptually interesting because it reframes it from like wh wh who runs the place, whatever. Like thinking of it in terms of organs, for me at least, is very helpful because the concepts aren't as literal uh, as some other kinds of questions that you might have. Um, but if you want to ask mm -hmm. those style of questions, then you might be like, is the city walled? How is it protected? What kind of government does it have? Uh, those are the more um, literal kind of questions that you ask yourself. And again, Reddit has a ton, a ton of, uh, of questions and concepts to ask yourself there. Way more than, you know, we do like a two hour episode to cover them all. Um, yeah. But uh, <laughs> it's worth looking, it's worth looking them up. Uh, and here before we close out, I know we've gone maybe a little long with this one, but, um, you know, it's a city, there's a lot going on. Uh, there are a couple of products, D&D uh, &D products out there. Actually, they're not D&D, &D, but they're very useful for D&D &D, uh, that you can uh, use to inspire you. And the first one is Blades in the Dark. We've talked a lot about Blades in the Dark before, different things you could take from it. One of the things you can take from it is how they structure and portray Duskfall, the, the city, the default city that's set there. And it's a district by district, street by street, tons of random tables. Random tables are just like, what things might the players find here? What are the sights, smells, sounds, and the like that, that they could encounter? It's brilliant and, and is like inspiration fuel for your fantasy cities. The other one is... Uh, uh, a supplement for uh, the Vagabonds of Dived, which is called uh, Dortoka, the city on the sea of glass. And it, it uh, introduces a procedural generation for cities. Now, Dortoka is a ruined city uh, that, that's kind of this urban hellscape that uh, the players venture in. But you could easily reframe it to be just any sort of fantasy city. It's got tables for factions, districts, neighborhoods, what it looks like, who's there, that kind of thing. They, both of those are highly, highly useful and not necessarily setting or system specific at all uh, for, um, you know, using your D&D games. I think we built a city. I think so. But, yeah, but not it's, all, it's but worth not it. not on rock and roll. Um, I was trying to figure out how to, a way to, to work that in, and I knew you would come through. I knew you would come through. Well, I mean, you know, it depends if you're running an all-bard game or not, whether or not you build your city on rock and roll. So, you know. Uh, <laughs> yes. 